Warning. Censorship. Warning. Censorship. Uh, so I've spent quite a bit of time looking at pictures of hate organizations, Hitler, Nazis, MAGA, mm -hmm. you know, Proud Boys, all that stuff all day long. Does it surprise you that he combines Hitler, Nazis, and MAGA? Uh, he's describing hate organizations. He's moderating for Facebook. He kind of throws MAGA in there. What is your reaction to that? So yeah, he groups together hate organizations, Hitler, Nazis, MAGA. So that's kind of how the moderators are conditioned to think like, hey, anything that's right wing, hey, it could, it could possibly be on the hate list. So In his first day, President Biden already issued a number of executive orders um, on areas that we as a company really care uh, quite deeply about. We have a system that uh, is able to freeze commenting on threads in cases where our systems are uh, detecting that there may be a thread that has hate speech or violence in the comments you are filing we have already initiated and will be publicly announcing and making available for everyone a lawsuit that we're filing against facebook inc regarding unfair competition yes. fraud yeah. false advertising and antitrust this is why i am suing the facebook fact checkers i'm suing them on behalf of you your favorite creators and news sites on behalf of our freedom of speech and thought at that point i was seeing them interfering on a global level in elections and then I saw a blatant exception that just targeted conservatives or favored liberals. Brian Hartwig is a Facebook insider and whistleblower with Project Veritas. He is president of the Hartwig Foundation for Free Speech, and you can follow him on Facebook, Instagram, Gab, and YouTube. His channel name is Ryan Hartwig Official. Of course, though, if you Google Ryan, you won't know most of that. Why would you? He is working to expose social media bias, however, and that is obviously not allowed. Ryan, thanks for joining us. How are you today? Yeah, thanks for having me on. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. I appreciate the, the opportunity. Oh, we appreciate you coming on. I love to talk about this sort of stuff. I've been in it for years. And as we speak, I wanted to get you on as soon as possible because there's new Project Veritas stuff coming out daily now, just like people did uh, with the CNN calls that were being broadcast on uh, Project Veritas's channels every day. Now it seems like there's going to be a Facebook meeting all the time, whether that's with Mark Zuckerberg or not. So I just want to play most of the first video that came out uh, this week from Project Veritas and uh, with their face, another Facebook insider leaking their meetings with Mark Zuckerberg and some other staff there. In his first day, President Biden already issued a number of executive orders um, on areas that we as a company really care uh, quite deeply about. But there has been quite a lot of disquiet expressed by many leaders around the world, from the president of Mexico to Alexander Navalny in Russia, the Chancellor Angela Merkel, and others saying, well, this shows that private companies have got too much power and they should be only making these decisions in a way that is framed by democratically uh, agreed rules. We agree with that. We agree with that. Mark will be very clear about that that ideally we wouldn't be taking these decisions on our own. We would be taking these decisions in line with and in conformity with democratically uh, uh, agreed uh, rules and principles. Um, and at the moment, those democratically, elect, uh, democratically agreed rules don't exist. We still have to take decisions in real time. We have a system that uh, is able to freeze commenting on threads in cases where our systems are uh, detecting that there may be a thread that has hate speech or violence sort of in the comments. These are all things we've built over the past three, four years as part of our investments into the integrity space or efforts to protect elections. I wonder whether or not we can use Oculus to help a white police officer understand what it feels like to be a young black man who's stopped and searched and arrested by the police. And I want every major decision to run through a civil rights lens. I think that these were, were all important and positive steps. And um, I, I am looking forward uh, to, to opportunities where Facebook is gonna be able to work together uh, with this new administration um, on some of their top priorities, starting uh, with the COVID response. So that campaign is called Expose Facebook. Ryan, why don't you tell us a little bit more, go a bit more in depth about what exactly we're seeing there from Zuckerberg and the team. 
So yeah, in this video we have you know a, a leaked call basically, and we have Nick Clegg, the head of global affairs for Facebook, talking about how yes, Facebook agrees we should follow the democratic process. So as an American, as, as a someone living in the United States, this <laughs> this really shocked me because uh, you know if if they had any respect for the rule of law or for the democratic process, then they would be following Section 230. And, and uh, I, I think it's insane to believe that it's correct in any country to delete the president of that country. Like, come on, guys, that's that's the democratic process. That's the leader of the nation. So they sent it to their, you know, their advisory board or their their uh, independent audit audit board. And so, yeah, this is just incredible. The, the fact that they're saying, yes, we agree we should follow the democratic process. Well, why don't you start with the First Amendment? Why don't you're a public square? Why are you censoring the, the uh, yeah the president of the of the United States. So what do you think is the thought process behind some of the stuff we saw in there? They're wanting to s disable conversations that ha include stuff that they call free speech. Do they actually want to make things better, the people working there? Do they think that they're changing the world by doing this? Or do they understand, do you think, that hate speech is actually subjective? Are these people aware that they're what they're saying might be might be seen by bigger people and they're just saying what they think other people want to hear? Or do they actually believe that they're making a real difference by subjectively censoring speech? I think they honestly think, uh, yeah, they they honestly think they're making a difference. Uh, they have been conditioned to think that way. I mean, if you're living in Silicon, excuse me, if you're living in Silicon Valley, you're living in a bubble. So uh, a lot of it is, you know, think they think they're protecting the world and, and uh, from violence or whatnot. So you had, you know, for example, in, in early January, you had a uh, an event in, in the capital, a, a protest, a peaceful protest, and there was some violence. But you have on the opposing side, you have lots of violence over the sum the last summer from Antifa, and you see how Facebook treats them differently. So I have it documented going back to 2017 that Facebook did not did not treat Antifa as a criminal organization, um, and yet after. And yet after one event at the Capitol, all of a sudden, sudden all the Trump supporters are violent racists. So, yeah. So it, it has moved really fast. And, and I struggle with, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying. They're in Silicon Valley. They're in this big bubble. But I kind of think that people who are at the level of Mark Zuckerberg and guys who are top level engineers and all this, they're not stupid people. They have to realize that there's un other opinions out there. Mark Zuckerberg says this stuff. So does that sort of thinking go all the way to the top, do you think, where we're saving the world? Yeah, I think part of it's saving the world. Part of it is just maybe engineers doing their job. So I worked as a content moderator for Facebook, but I was subcontracted by Cognizant. Mm -hmm. And our goal was to make the client happy. Facebook was the client. So maybe there's engineers who, look, they're getting paid really well. Maybe they have some more qualms about it, but at the end of the day, they're getting a paycheck, uh, and you know, that that's all that, that's all that matters for them. So, I mean, there, there, there's people there who may have may think they're helping the world, uh, helping protect the world, keep the the world a safer place. But you know, that's part of the argument of of uh, Section 230. Why Section 230 was created in the first place was to protect the internet from children. And so now we're looking, now we're seeing that Facebook is using 230 is basically a brand protection tool. Because if, if we were to follow Section 230 as it's written, like Facebook could not censor as much as they censor. And, and Facebook would not be as much popular, is not be as popular because they could not um, restrict as much content as they're restricting. And uh, Section 230 has been misinterpreted by the, the Ninth Circuit Court. Um, and it's given Facebook additional protections. Uh, and so Jason Fick, he had a lawsuit that was about to be heard by the Supreme Court that was, re and, and they declined hearing that uh, case earlier this month in the United States. It was Jason Fick, FYK versus Facebook. So once again, the US Supreme Court has failed us. So our democratic processes have failed us. I think we're facing a constitutional crisis because we had that election lawsuit in Texas, from Texas that was tossed out by the US Supreme Court and we also had this earlier in January, we had this case from Jason Fick thrown out. So, I mean, we're, we're trying to follow the democratic process. We're trying to rein in these companies, but they've been given undue uh, protections under Section 230. And Section 230 has been misinterpreted. It needs to be reinterpreted uh, by the Supreme Court.
not repealed. That would be the wrong solution. Uh, so that's part of this larger debate. I mean, yeah, you have these employees who are trying to do, who think they're trying to do the right thing, but the laws have been shaped in such a way that Facebook, they can do whatever they want and they never get in trouble. So what Facebook should do is they should uh, make a spirit of the policy decision. So a lot of times when I was a constant moderator, we would make decisions based on the spirit of the policy. So the policy, the, the letter of the policy said one thing, but we could basically break the rules a little bit and make a spirit of the policy decision. And Facebook should do the same thing. They should say, look, maybe there is some violence with the president, but based on the spirit of the policy, the wrong thing would be to remove Trump completely from Facebook and Instagram. So I think they should follow their, their do maybe do what we did sometimes as, con as content moderators and follow the spirit of the policy. But who determines what the spirit of policy is? And that's very subjective. And that's the issue is at the end of the day, it's six people on the global policy team in, in San Francisco, maybe, maybe in Ireland, who make these subjective decisions about the spirit of their policy. Are these six people well known or are they public people? Or are they, are, are they public and people who nobody would hear of or have heard of if they heard their name? I don't think they're public, but they should be public. I mean, with the amount of power that Facebook wields, uh, there should be a government oversight board in each country where these uh, you know, global employees make decisions that affect each country, whether it's Canada or the United, or the United States or Venezuela. Um, so yeah, they really should... Uh, Facebook really should be accountable. Now they say they have a, um, I see advisory board, but it's the wrong word. There's there's some kind of a independent uh, board that they have. And so they, so they said, oh, well, we sent it to appeal. We sent our decision for appeal to that, that body. Um, but I think they really should just have, we should break up Facebook. There's some antitrust legislation. We really should uh, break up, uh, Facebook and I mean, maybe each country should have their own version of Facebook. I know in Brazil where I've done some interviews, they have different versions of uh, different companies like Patria book. And there's one called conservative core. Um, but yeah, there's, and there's other lawsuits that, that are coming out. I just saw this one about Steven Crowder. Thanks for, uh, I, uh, this one from Steven Crowder. Um, I think he just announced it yesterday or two days ago. Yeah. So they're suing. Yeah. I wanted to play a clip of that. We can get your thoughts about that. Just a, it's a good minute and a half of what I think the, the crux of their lawsuit is going to be. You are filing. We have already initiated and will be publicly announcing and making available for everyone a lawsuit that we're filing against Facebook Inc. regarding unfair competition, yes. fraud, Good. false advertising, and antitrust. Woo. So you've done more than all the Republican senators. <laughs> A little bit, yes. A little wow. bit. Yeah. And I know that behind the scenes we've been disappointed that not a lot of, there have been four years and not a lot has been done about big tech. Um, can you clarify, because a lot of people go out and complain here uh, about being banned or having something removed and they're filing some petition. Uh, this is different from that. We are filing, in fact, you have filed a lawsuit and it's available at lidowithcrowder.com. There's going to be more information there. Uh, we're going to be providing that. We'll be keeping updates on folks. That's why I'm going to be spending more time away from the show and focusing on the lawsuit as we move forward. The reason why it's different is because we're going after Facebook based on its own words and its own promises. It's a platform that was ever since 2016 when the Gizmodo article came out and said, oh, we're suppressing the feed. We're taking yeah. certain views and we're going to suppress them in the trending and news topics. We don't do that anymore. That's what Facebook said. We don't do it. They told Congress we don't do it. They told the consumers we don't do it. They told us that they don't do it. But over the course of the years, we've realized they actually are doing it. And we've seen it from the election stream that was cut off from various posts and other things that have been suppressed. Did we ever get a reason throttling. as to why that stream was cut off? Not None. So my question to you, Ryan, is just like Stephen Crowder said, they're doing more than a lot of these politicians are. I like to point as to one person as Ted Cruz as being somebody who is very vocally uh, against the tech censorship and a lot of the stuff we've been seeing on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. But a question that most people ask and, and that I have asked is why didn't the Republicans do anything when they controlled um, all the branches? Are they getting stalemated by, by uh, let's call them rhino Republicans or, or whatever you want to call them against people who don't believe in that as, as, part, of a, as part of a broader problem that we have? Or did they just drop the ball? What do you think happened? Why do you think it's taking these lawsuits that we're hearing about now to actually hold these companies accountable? Yeah, Andrew. So, uh, yeah, Ted Cruz has been a, a, a great proponent, along with Josh Hawley, a senator mm -hmm. from Missouri, 
uh, and they've pushed back against Facebook. I think, uh, yeah, for the first two years of the Trump presidency, we, you know, we we controlled the, uh, uh, the Senate and the House, and nothing was done about it. And this last year, uh, in late late 2020, we had quite a few different hearings with uh, congressional hearings and Senate hearings where uh, big tech executives were questioned. But everyone always asks, well, you know, they keep on having these hearings and asking questions and nothing happens. Um, in July of last year, um, we had a I helped uh, with a criminal referral against Mark Zuckerberg that was submitted by Congressman Matt Gates. Uh, for alleged perjury to, to Congress, because in 2018, right after I start work, started working for Facebook, uh, Mark Zuckerberg testified that they do not censor political speech, but I have evidence that they do. And so, in in, in another hearing last this last year, uh, Jim Sensenbrenner is a congressman from I believe uh, Wisconsin, and he was talking about how well we shouldn't punish uh, companies that are successful, right? So, I mean, being successful is one thing, but de literally destroying the competition is another thing. And, uh, you know, I, uh, that, that brings into question, I mean, the issue of Parler. Uh, we have Parler that just got deleted, pretty much deleted off the inter Internet. The Amazon AWS servers were, uh, you know, were removed off the Internet. But, uh, but yeah, uh, this Steven Crowder lawsuit is is good because it's based on uh, basically uh, the anti-business practices. Um, and I think antitrust might be the way to go. I know also in, I believe in December, 48 states uh, filed a lawsuit against Facebook, an antitrust lawsuit. So if we can't get them with Section 230, I think uh, antitrust might be the way to go. So I'm, I'm heartened by these uh, various lawsuits coming. Yeah, I hope it works out as the the same way now i was under sort of an uh and i think a, at least a few people were that uh facebook gave up trying to to withhold their standing as a as a platform as opposed to a publisher and, and i guess from what i'm hearing from you is that i'm actually wrong about that so there is um a laura loomer lawsuit that she had with facebook which i believe i don't want to miss uh, misstate it was one of the russian publications either rt or sputnik's uh, article that said that basically Facebook in their lawsuit had admitted that they are a publisher and therefore they can uh, um, delete what they want. But it sounds to me from what I'm hearing that I'm wrong about that, so I'll concede about that. Um, another lawsuit that I want to talk about, because we're talking, these are all coming at, at good times, I'd say. Candace Owens yeah. is starting has started a lawsuit against particularly the fact checkers that, you know, flag articles, get people... Uh, uh, taken off their profiles, taken off community strikes, things of that nature. So I want to play a bit of her clip that she posted. I think she just had a baby, so she's probably not updating that right now. But if we can go ahead and get to that clip, I want to get your reaction to yet another lawsuit against Facebook's fact-checking uh, company. I guess you call it. In 2016, hysterical liberals had to find someone to blame for their humiliating loss to Donald Trump. In their minds, they could not possibly have lost due to their own horrendous candidates or policies or their own failing message, so they attacked the one thing that they did not have total control over, social media companies. They applied extreme pressure to silence or censor fake news, which was just a fancy way of saying news that they don't like. Facebook bent to that pressure and created a fact checker network with godlike powers over all of us. Here is how Facebook fact checking works. A website you have never heard of, run by partisan beta leftists, stalk the pages of your favorite conservative personalities. Whenever we say anything they disagree with, these fact checkers write a vicious partisan hit piece. Then they harass us and our audience by slapping hazardous warning labels on what we have posted. Many times, those labels say, missing context or disputed. Yes, thanks, Facebook. Every political argument in America is disputed. Every argument is indeed missing some context. <laughs> now, Ryan, how to get through Candace is obviously, she's got to make an entertaining video though, but how accurate is what she's saying? Take us from the point of where Facebook decided it needed fact checkers. Was that during the election in 2016 or was that decision decided before the election season and just happened to be implemented? How did it come about? Do you know? 
As far as I know, there was not much fact checking going on prior to 2016. So uh, from what I heard, you know, when I was working at Facebook, the kind of the rumors and, and when I asked around, people would say that after 2016 is when Facebook decided to move all the content moder- a lot of content moderators to the United States. So prior to 2016, there weren't many U.S.-based or Can- Canadian-based content moderators. Now, it, content moderating is different from fact checking. Just to be clear, I, I was not a fact checker. But, um, but yeah, this, this momentum to prioritize U.S. elections and North American elections started in uh, 20, 2016, 2017. So Cognizant, the company I worked for, received the, the contract in 2017, a three-year, $200 million contract. And so, uh, I mean, there's a lot of money being spent, billions and billions of dollars on content moderation. Now, as far as fact checking, yeah, the, I, I believe, you know, people, um, I believe this would be a way that Facebook could essentially remove themselves from liabilities. They could mm-hmm. say, well, we didn't, we didn't do the fact checking. We had this company do it. But something that's really fascinating is that, that I believe is similar to what happened with these fact checking companies is, uh, for example, we at Cognizant, we received guidance posts from uh, essentially from Facebook, but it was posted by a Cognizant employee. But I was told in the, they, they have a back channel to Facebook and they essentially just copy paste the instructions from Facebook. So Facebook you know, emails the guidance to our, our supervisors and then our supervisors post. So, so uh, and we, we're using the workplace chat, uh, their, the client tool. So that's one way that Facebook removes the liability, liability. They can say, oh, well, we didn't give those instructions. Well, yes, you did. You gave instructions to a cognizant supervisor who then told all of us to to take a certain action. And um, Facebook definitely prioritized, yeah, the 2020 election. They created a new queue uh, for content moderators. Uh, and so basically more content was flagged. Uh, they increased the amount of content that was going to be flagged because, uh, yeah, so uh these are a few things that Facebook did. They they created a new civic harassment queue just for the 2020 U.S. election. And uh, I also saw that Facebook uh, was we were, we were we were moderating content in Canada as well. So Facebook definitely prioritizes uh, the elections, and we are their eyes and ears. So um, yeah, for example, before you could, yeah, I, I guess I'll I'll leave it at that. <laughs> so what Candace yeah. is talking about there is they create. When there's a fact check, and this has happened to us here, of course, um, like you said, Facebook is not responsible for the fact check. Um, let's say you par- post an article about X, and then the fact check says, no, it's actually X, Y. They create this article that says, here's why it's X, Y, and here's why you shouldn't believe um, what this article X says. And a lot of right. that is completely subjective information, and a lot of it is such nitpicking. And I want to bring up what I think is the original fact check that made it so that CNN has one, NBC has one, Facebook has one. And Justin, can we bring that up? It's the famous acid wash (laughs) fact check, and I'll never forget it. Trump claims that Hillary Clinton acid washed her email server. That's no, it says, nope, the truth. Clinton's team used an app called Bleachbit, and she did not use a corrosive chemical. And that still to this day, this is what I see a lot of fact checks being on Facebook and Instagram. And the problem with that is when you say um, it's not actually blue, it's a marine color, is that you're messing with people's um, reach, which affects the amount of money they can make, which affects how many their audience that they can reach, which in turn will affect how many sales they might get. Views turn into sales, they turn into subscriptions, they turn into merchandising, they turn into touring, they turn into all sorts of things. So do you think that the fact checkers think Again, just like we talked about with Facebook, do you think they're doing what's right? Because the guy who started this website used to work for CNN. I don't know if you're aware about aware of that, but the guy who runs the the main fact checking website. So, do you think this was uh, this was spawned out of an inherent bias, or or again, are we doing what must be done, Ryan? Are we saving the universe from these slight differences in factoids? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, the actual employees themselves are, you know, probably just trying to get a paycheck and make a living uh, and trying to make the client happy. But yeah, I don't think it's a coincidence that, it's, that the former, you know, leader, former leaders from from news companies are forming these companies. There seems to be a very um, uh, buddy-buddy relationship, kind of a 
close relationship with with these tech executives and and the news organizations. Um, I mean, if you can control the narrative, then you, you just you can control so many things uh, throughout the country. So, um, you know, I yeah. So it's with the fact checking companies. Yeah, there's definitely it's they're definitely being uh, influenced by by these these organizations by CNN um, and it's yeah we we should we should be looking to form a fact checker well there shouldn't even be i don't think there should be fact checking in the first place i mean it comes down to the idea of what you know are humans intelligent enough to make decisions mm -hmm. yeah there is misinformation then if there's misinformation then we should actually be focusing more money on educating people in the school system so that they can uh have critical thinking skills so it's, it's it's essentially a slap in the face and, and offensive to say that we need fact checkers because it's saying that we're not capable of doing critical our own critical thinking. Um, so, I mean, and, yeah, and this comes down to, you know, what is Facebook's actual goal? And I was a content moderator for two years uh, working for Facebook, and I saw them influencing on a foreign level, um, giving instructions to delete certain things. And there's another whistleblower who came back who went public last year, late last year with uh, BuzzFeed News. Her name was Sophie Zhang. She was a Facebook data scientist. And she has said essentially, well, she corroborates the fact that they are influencing elections on a global level uh, by their inaction and allowing political leaders to, to uh, you know, basically rig the system and, and engineer, engineer Facebook using bots to manipulate elections. But but yeah, what is Facebook's actual goal? I mean, what is their what's their end game, right? I mean, a lot of people ask this. Uh and I mean, the only thing that really makes sense is going to sound kind of cliché, but it, it, and the only thing that makes sense is world domination. I mean, they are they're, glo they're a global company. They say they're trying to unite the world or or whatnot, but uh it kind of reminds me of of Blade Runner. You know, you have these global corporations that uh, just take over and and they don't respect the rule of law. They don't respect democratic processes, contrary to what Nick Clegg, the head of of global affairs, says that they don't care about the First Amendment in the, in the United States. They could care less. They all they care about is their brand and and making money and uh, and protecting their brand. And right now they're running roughshod over other countries or conservatives throughout Canada and the United States throughout the world. They're running roughshod over nationalist movements, uh, just people who are patriotic, who, who want to uh, prioritize their, their country and, and uh, make their country great. And so th that's what this comes down to. I mean, Facebook has way too, regardless of whether you're on the right or the left, like Facebook has way too much power right now. We need to rein them in. They are not respecting the rule of law. They're not respecting political leaders. Florida just passed, uh, the governor of Florida is is passing legislation to fine the tech companies $100,000 a day uh, when when uh, Facebook deplatforms uh, political candidates. So the, the, fact, the fact that that's where we're at says a lot, where we have mm -hmm. to make take action against Facebook because they're deplatforming political candidates. So that's part of the, once again, going back to the original statement from Nick Clegg, that's part of the democratic process is people run for office and in a public forum, you cannot silence a public, someone running for public office. They have the right to speak, to communicate. And so Facebook is not following, following the spirit of, of the First Amendment in, in the United States. Yeah, and a lot of this has to do with a lack of a competition. And as you just said earlier, they can just kick off almost anybody who, who dissents, and they're taking it out of the hands of the regular person of you and me to decide what we want to listen to and, and uh, what we believe and not believe. Um, one more thing about censorship that it came like kind of home, as, as if it hasn't come home to roost with you enough, but you were suspended from Twitter. I checked before we started this interview, you're still suspended. What day did that happen and do we know why yet? Yeah, so this past Thursday, um... Yeah, this past Thursday I got suspended, and I don't know why. Like I, I posted a link to um, what was the name of it? Uh, Pocketnet.app. So yeah, I got so this has been this past day, thir that's past Thursday, January twenty eighth. There was a couple of things I shared that week that maybe were questionable. I actually did post or share a, a screenshot of when I filmed at Facebook <laughs> last week as well. So maybe they looked at that. But uh, I mean, this is. 
yeah, it's it's crazy. So I, I had about thirty five thousand followers. I have about fifty, about half of that's probably in Brazil. Um, but yeah, after January sixth, there were a lot of people purged. So I early January I was about I was at forty three thousand followers, and then I dropped down to thirty five, and then they ban they suspended me. But I emailed them. I'm gonna pr probably be sending them a, a legal letter this week to their headquarters. And uh, yeah, it's it's just super ironic. Um, it is super ironic, Andrew, that they suspend the uh, president of the Hartwig Foundation for free speech. <laughs> uh, like you're, I'm a free speech foundation. My my purpose. I, I'm a nonprofit in Arizona. I'm gonna apply for 501c3 status. But my purpose is to advocate for free speech on the internet. And guess what happened to me? They suspended me. So. I think that's it's, kind of funny. Yeah, it seems like the only way at this point to move forward with these people is litigation. So that we're going to end the paywall segment here. We're going to move behind the safety of Rebel News Plus. If you guys want to see the rest of the episode, go to rebelnewsplus.com, or if you're logged in, you can click subscribe in the top right corner. So say goodbye to our YouTube audience, Ryan. What are we going to be talking about, you ask? We're going to talk about the real reason Parler was deleted, what Ryan thinks, and some of the psychological conspiracies that are surrounding Facebook and Facebook's origin. So rebelnewsplus.com, you guys, and you can see the full episode. Thank you for watching, Andrew Says. If you want to see the full uncut version, go to rebelnewsplus.com and sign up today so you can see the entire episode where we talk about topics we can't show you on YouTube. They'll ban us.